This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I just have a couple of questions, and you know we can go back to uh, the material that was in your slides too. But I mean, first of all, I mean there's so much packed into this essay, uh, essay uh, into this episode of the, the Devil's Mark. I mean, we've got law, politics, religion, sex, um, friendship, time travel, sex. You know, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> all the great stuff. Yeah, all the great, all the great stuff, and just. Uh, like to hear a little bit more, I think we'd all like to hear a little bit more, just about some of the challenges of writing this, uh, especially um, uh, when you are trying to stay true to the books. Uh, and um, how did your writing team come together? And mm -hmm. how would you describe your writing team? Because uh, you, had, you had mentioned that it was important that not everyone be someone who had read the novels. Right, right. Yeah, um, our team, and we only have four, four writers, which is unusual because mm -hmm. most of the time in, in, um, in Hollywood they, they can have 10 to 13 people on staff, which I think is too many, too many voices. And we have uh, the Lean Mean Machine, um, and most of us have worked with Ron Moore before. I worked with him on three other shows. So uh, I was Galactica. Um, Roswell, Roswell, starting on Roswell, HBO's Carnival um, and Battlestar Galactica. And um, I had heard of this show. Um, I'd, I'd seen it in the papers and thought, oh, that's an interesting concept, but I'd never read the books. And then Ron, um, you know, I got a call one day and it was like, do you want to come interview for this show uh, tomorrow? You know, like tomorrow. And I didn't have time to really research anything and I knew it came from a book. And I was like, I'll go to the bookstore and pick up the book on the way to the interview and flip through it in the parking lot, and I'll ace it. I'll ace the interview. So I go and buy this book, and it's a gigantic book, <laughs> this big. And I'm like, oh, my God, I should have done my homework. I should have read this. I, I don't know what I was thinking. I'm sitting in the parking lot trying to memorize stuff. Who, Claire, Jamie, I don't know. And, um, and I went in, and, and Ron was kind of holding forth, and this and that, and the Jacobite Rebellion, and Bonnie Prince Charlie, and all that. And I'm like, oh yeah, Bonnie Prince Charlie. <laughs> and I'm just acting like I know all about Scotland in the 1700s, which I knew nothing. The Jacobite and, Rebellion, um, the first or the second? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> actually there were four. See, now I, I know, that, know everything, more than I want to know. But, um, but uh, actually, you know, I think he hired me mainly because he trusted me and we'd worked together before. Um, but of the four writers, what, what he said was it was important that some of us know the books and some of us d don't. So two of us had read all the books and were very, very familiar with them, and two of us um, had not read the books at all. And it, it didn't mean we weren't fans, it just meant that we weren't, we weren't thinking ahead. Because it's a little dangerous when you're trying to write the outland or the first book, if you know what's happening in book seven, it can cloud what you're thinking and then they can all blur together. And so he wanted people that weren't. And so in the room, I constantly have to go like, spoiler, spoiler, don't tell me, because something will slip and they'll go, when so-and-so kills so-and-so, or so-and-so has this baby, and I'll be like, no, no, I don't want to know. So, um, so it, was, it was important to have a mix in the room. Mm -hmm. And we have two women and two men, and we have uh, a lot of uh, spirited, spirited discussions in the room, because I think everyone pretty much likes different things, like some, some Writers love the battle and the politics and the intrigue, and some of us like love the romance and, and the you know the lovey-dovey stuff. And and um, everybody likes certain characters. My like you know Ira really loves Blackjack Randall and writes a very good Blackjack. And um, I think Matt writes a great Jamie. And I I've always loved Galus and and wanted mm. to write the the story of Claire and, and Galus. So I think we mm. all champion different characters. So we all have something to, to contribute, and it's a nice mix of, of personalities and um, you know interests that make the, the staff work right. smoothly. Well, one of the remarkable things about 
uh, this show, but also about the original novels. I mean, Diana um, Gabaldon, the, uh, Gabaldon, the uh, writer, always takes such pride, as she says, in dancing between genres, you know, and that she's done, uh, because her books get sold, she never knows where they're going to be stacked in the bookstore, you mm -hmm. know, fiction, historical fiction, historical nonfiction. Right. right. Uh, uh, because they're very researched and very accurate in many ways. Science fiction, fantasy, romance, mystery, military history, gay and lesbian, horror. And in this case, even like criminal procedural. Yeah. Yeah, criminal procedural. Uh, and so this show has to juggle so, I mean, well, has to juggle. Also, has so many opportunities because you have tropes that you can work with from right. each of these genres. Right, right. And I was wondering if you were, um, I mean, you, talk, you talked about how you like to write uh, a character with Gellis and you like to write female friendships. Uh, I was also uh, wondering, I mean, one of the things that you uh, have experience with is writing with another uh, universe that has time travel in it. And that's the Terminator universe. Ah, yes. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering. Uh, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about uh, the time travel narrative and some of the complexities of dealing with the time travel narrative. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very, very complicated <laughs> um, time travel, and you can get you can what we call go down the rabbit hole if you really start examining and going. Well, if this one went back here, how did they land there? And if they changed this, could this change? But then that didn't change. And, like, I mean, it gets, it gets really crazy, but it's endlessly fascinating. So we mm -hmm. love talking about it, and we spend hours and hours talking about it. Um, but in the end, you know, we have what's called uh, refrigerator logic. It's a term writers use, and they go, you know, what it means is, like, if, if the next day you open your refrigerator to look for your yogurt or something, and you're, and you're wondering, wait, how did that happen on that show last night? Well, then we didn't do our job because really what's important is what's happening between the characters and the emotion and, and some of the stuff we try to be as accurate as we can, whether it's historical accuracy or time travel stuff. We mm -hmm. try to keep it, not, not just throw out all the rules and do whatever, you know, because then it's not respectful to the audience. But we do, we do the best job we can on that stuff, but we figure, you know, if, if they're paying too close of attention to all that stuff, you know, they're not really enjoying the story. They're just picking it apart. So we know that you guys give us a pass on some of this stuff. And we find little errors sometimes and go, oh, God, we didn't realize if she <laughs> lived in that time, how could she? Uh. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's, uh, it's entertainment. And, and, and a lot of times we'll get a, a, a note from the historian or something, and they'll be like, they didn't use this kind of handkerchief back in the 1700s. Or, <laughs> you know, they didn't have whatever. And we'll be like, it's about time travel. <laughs> None of it is real. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Pe pe well, we do try to be accurate, and we have people that go to the ends of the earth to get us the costumes, or even the even you know you guys know Terry Dressback, our uh, amazing costume designer. They get the actual fabrics that were used back then. They feel it's important for the characters to feel the weight on them of the real wool or whatever it is that they wore back then, and not some you know, Hollywood version uh, of that, not some fake thing. Because um, you can watch other shows, I won't name any, because they're all, they all try really hard mm -hmm. and they're enjoyable, but some of them have less budget than mm -hmm. others. But, you know, you don't want to see mascara and makeup or, or things that you could wear to the prom, you know, nowadays in a historical drama. So we, we try to get real swords and real, everything we try to use is almost, you know, we go really importantly uh, to try to make it real. Because you uh, are so successful at being historically accurate and also uh, uh, playing with time travel so that you don't get into too many of those time travel paradoxes, uh, uh, when you do mess with it, it's so effective. I mean, when she comes out, when Gellis comes out with that anachronistic line, I think I'm going <laughs> to be <some> barbecue. <laughs> uh. Well, I have to give Ron, Ron, that's actually a line of Ron's. I have to credit him with that line, and it is my favorite line in the show. Um, but we, you know, I think, um, yeah, in the book, she doesn't realize that Galus is from the 60s until it, she's, she gets burned. She never knows anything. She sees the vaccination scar, so she knows something's up. But later, much later, in a cave somewhere, Dougal says, 
she told me to give you a message in 1968, and then Claire knows oh, that's when she's from. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Ron kept saying to me, we can't have these two women in the thieves' hole for two full nights and getting drunk uh, together <laughs> and not, have a, not finally have this conversation of that, that, you know, we're both from the future. But, of course, we couldn't step on Claire and Jamie because this was the big episode where she was going to tell Jamie she's from the future. So you don't want to hear her tell Gillis the whole thing. So we had many discussions back and forth about this, um, and what was decided, you know, together was that we, we would do this scene right at the zero hour, right before they get sentenced, where suddenly this, you know, we, le we drop little crumbs and little hints and the, the line about, um, you know, what you would give for your country. Mm -hmm. I only have one life to give for my country, and she's like, interesting. Mm -hmm. You're from the future. <laughs> you know? But they, they've always just had suspicions about each other, but in this episode, you know, what we did finally in that, scene in the back room was have her say, you know, at the barbecue, and then um, then Claire's like, w what? What did she just say? But there's no time to mm -hmm. to discuss it, and that was the compromise, because we wanted them, we wanted, I, I wanted, and this wasn't in the book, um, that that uh, that for the story, for the two stories to tie together, because they really are almost like two episodes. There's the witch trial, and then the whole thing with Jamie in the future. And I always wanted to write all of it. And when it was up on the board in the writer's room, people would be like, oh, the trial's really different. Maybe that stuff should move into the next episode. And I was like, no, no, it needs to stay in this episode because I really wanted to write it. And, but to do that, I really needed a bridge and needed to make sure that those two halves fit together. And for me, the organic way to, to, to do that was to, to say, in my mind, that Claire had this friend that she kind of love hated and and went through this this ordeal with mm -hmm. in the thieves hole in this life and death trial but she didn't in the end she didn't really know her because they never really talked about how they were both from the future and they so I, I wanted to leave her with this regret of that like God if we'd have I mean, figured this out earlier months ago there would have been so much to talk about and we could have mm -hmm. maybe been closer and maybe it's not right to keep things from the people that you love, or because you, there will always be this wall between you, and so I wanted to, to to have that regret about, oh my God, she just barbecue, and realize I can't keep this secret anymore from the man I love, and have mm -hmm. that be part of what motivated her to to finally tell Jamie uh, I'm from the future, and so in my mind I connected those dots mostly selfishly to keep both hats in my episode, but um, yeah. but those are the kind of things that we find in the novel. I mean. Diana writes them, and she wrote these, God, what, 20 years ago or something, mm -hmm. this book. Um, and we just like to fill in the cracks of, of what, you know, the framework's already there, and we hit the big, the big events and the big tent poles, but we need to fill in what's there. And we all, you know, we all have egos as writers. We want a little bit of ourselves in it. Otherwise, it's not very fun to just write something you're transcribing mm -hmm. from a book. But I'll take things from the book, small things, and make them bigger, like the starling murmuration. Yeah. Um, at the beginning is just we have these title cards for the episodes and really I was procrastinating one night trying not to you know trying to find reasons not to write so I'm like ah go to YouTube and look up what's the video of the day you know and, <laughs> and uh, I think they had on YouTube this starling murmuration which I thought was amazing and I was like I gotta get that in the show and um, Terry had made this dress for um, for Galas that we call the raven dress because it looks like raven feathers and she's like we always sort of call her the raven, you know, the, the dark mistress, whatever. And, and I thought, well, she's bird-like, and maybe I can do this thing with birds that flock together. And so we, um, and Alicia Bazet, our amazing, um, one of our post producers, found the, the shot of the, of the starlings for the beginning. And uh, my favorite part of it, and because and, it's the part that I added, but it felt Diana-like to me, you know, because we, we, we try to make it seamless where you can't even remember anymore what she wrote or what we wrote because we try to keep it, just feather it in like that. And I like Claire looking out through the bars and seeing the bird and saying, let's stick together. And Gail is just laughing at her and saying, nah, you know, and kind of, you know, and <laughs> you're just a bird, just a silly crow. I, I thought that illustrated the difference between them. And, and um, it, was, it was satisfying because uh, Katrina told me that was one of her favorite things because she felt like it said something about Claire mm. and her backstory because there's very little of that. We know very little. Her parents died when she was young and mm -hmm. she was raised by her uncle. And there's not much in the show about her background. And she said, I like that she went to watch the birds. Mm. And, um, and so, so, you know, that's just part of us.
putting things in, but that feel like it could have been the book. Feel like it could have been the book. Um, I, w I would like to talk about um, uh, sex uh, <laughs> in, in the show. Uh, in the show, the, uh, as many of you know, uh, the, fi uh, the you know this show uh, has been uh, critically appreciated. It has been lauded for being one of uh, the only shows uh, anywhere to appeal to uh, the female spectator, to appeal to female pleasure. You know, and also the show is often invidiously compared to some other shows, you know, Game of Thrones uh, and uh, True Blood, <laughs> you know, who uh, kind of use sex for special effects, you know, sex for shock, use sex for, uh, uh, you know, sex as uh, a sign of the character's immorality, depravity, you know, and some of the things that are said about um, uh, Outlander, uh, this show, that it approaches sex in a way that's only shocking because it isn't shocking at all. Uh, uh, it's nonviolent, sensual, natural, and the woman is framed as more than an object for male pleasure. Uh, female sexuality isn't demonized, and engaging in sex doesn't diminish Claire as a character. Uh, Outlander is the rare television drama that shows us a woman who is sexually experienced without being the villain of the piece. <laughs> you know, and I'm just thinking, we just in here on Tuesday night, we showed uh, Niagara, uh, Technicolor film noir with Marilyn Monroe in the only uh, 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 film where she played the villainous, mm. you know, and, and, and she's just, wow. I mean, so villainous, you know, and is just such an equation of female sexuality and villainy, you know. So I was uh, thinking about that with, with Outlander where a woman who is sexually experienced isn't evil, you know. She isn't right, a femme fatale, right. you know. She's just right. a woman who experiences pleasure. And then the man who sees uh, her desire and pleasure as a participatory experience, you know, uh, rather than an object to edify his own importance. Right, right. So I, I know uh, what a challenge it must be. And also, I mean, this is, it's also political. This is sexual politics right here. You know? <laughs> and the way it, I, I'm just interested to think about your process and the writer's process uh, when you are doing this, because it is so distinctive about mm -hmm. this show. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that comes from the book because it's written, you know, by Diana wrote it in this sort of, as the female point of view, and um, a lot of the stuff, the sexual stuff we do comes from the book. Um, and I, you had asked me this question earlier, and I said, we don't, we've gotten a lot of accolades for the female gaze and all that, and I can't say that it's something planned. Like, it's not like we said, let's, let's make a breakthrough show, we're going to do uh, you know, we're not, we're not, I think if you try to plan it and do it like that, it would come off not natural. It would be mm -hmm. like trying too hard. It somehow just, you know, evolved. And, and maybe because we had the two men and two women on the staff plus Ron, um, we, we just have a lot of, of discussions about this and everybody brings something different to the table. And, um, you know, it's something that just m organically morphs, you know, and then and we didn't really plan it or try it. Um, in, in this episode, I, we specifically wanted it to be, um, and I can't even, again, see, I can't remember how it was in the book. I think they do spend the night together and make love uh, the one last time. And I think he is trying to memorize her face, but I think they do, maybe they go all the way in the book. Someone should know, one of you guys. Um, <laughs> But uh, I liked it, I, I specifically wanted it to be, I, th I think they do make love in the book, and I think it was, it was maybe me, or it came out of the room, that he specifically says, I want to watch you, and I don't want to, you know, because if, if it's his, he thinks it's his last night forever with, with her, and he's never going to see her again. So mm -hmm. I, in my mind, I don't think he's that worried about himself. He wants to memorize her face and her beauty. And oh yeah, there was a little blowback from the guys in the room. Uh, of like, is this is this uh, you know credible that a guy would 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 a guy you know would a guy not want you know not want to do it? But um, we thought that you know Jane, we're not talking about any guy. We're talking about Jamie, <laughs> the king of men. 
Um, and you know, this is a woman's this is a woman's fantasy. So uh, I believe it. I mean, if I if I was gonna you know lose someone, I mean, I think you know, yeah, you know, you, you it's a, it's not it's not about the sex. It's about the memorizing and the last time you're gonna have this person. And um, I can you know, so I think he just stares at her all night and thinks that that that's it. Also, in my mind, I, I don't think I'd want to know, like, that was the last time. I'd rather think, oh, you know, the last time was that other great time, because they do it so much. Anyway, they have a good time. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, and we did, I did a um, On Your Feet Soldier, uh, actually was an homage to the pilot, which only um, certain people will remember, probably, but the front row will. And maybe you guys will now, because you know, but in the pilot, uh, you know, there's a, a, a famous moment where, Ron wrote, and she says, um, on your way, soldier. And um, and now it's kind of a thing that she says. I think we even have it this season. She has a moment where she says that. So I just thought that was, a, you know, her coming back to him. You know, you never know in this show where it's, where it's going to go. And uh, I was listening to a podcast where they were, they were trying to guess what they had done, and they were like, I think she went back. She went all the way back. And next season we're going to see that she goes back, and that's when she made the decision to come back to him here. And it'll be like filling in what this episode was or something. And I was like, what? What? <laughs> no, no, no. She didn't go. She decided not to go. She, she, she came back. She didn't go all the way back, spend a year, and then come back. Um, but that was a cool theory. Maybe they should come to the writer's room. <laughs> um, and, you know, and when she's making, I mean, Katrina is so amazing and Sam, that, that um, here's what I can tell you about the writing. Something else is that sometimes you don't need any writing. Because her face is so mm. amazing that when we went to shoot um, that scene, there was a whole bunch of dialogue and a whole bunch of voiceover where she's going, which life should I ma you know, pick? Which man do I want? He's really great, but he's also really great. He has a kill. Um, <laughs> but this guy's intellectual. I mean, she went on and on, you know. And when we shot it, it was like, you know what? You really don't need any words at all. You just need Katrina's face and those two rings, and you know what she's thinking. And so it was one time I was happy to just cut all the dialogue out of it. Um, and actually, it was our director's, um, it was our director's idea to, 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 to do the two rings. And I hope this doesn't spoil it for anybody, but we actually shot that at a different time because we had shot her at the Stones, but he wanted the ring close up. So he was like, we didn't have time to get it. So he's like, we'll get it on another day. And I said, but what are we, what, we were at the Stones. And he's like, well, Put one in the truck. We'll carry it around. So, so we actually took one, the, the, one of the big stones, threw it in the back of a truck, and everywhere we went for two weeks, we had, we had the stone. And then at lunchtime, we'd go, can we grab that ring shot? And Katrina would be like, oh, God, I want to eat my lunch. Do I have to come do the?" But she's a trooper, so you know, one day we caught her at lunch, and she'd mm -hmm. had her had her lunch, and we're like, come over here, just five minutes. We just need to sit down. And we, we just literally pulled the the stone out of the back of a pickup truck, <laughs> stuck it in the middle of, I don't know, a highway or something, sat her down, she did the rings, it was a close-up, so you couldn't mm -hmm. tell what was around her, and, and it's beautiful, and it works, and you would never know that it was shot, like, yeah. nowhere mm -hmm. near the stone, but, mm -hmm. uh, but that's the magic, the magic of television, how to look to outside this room. And also the magic of writing and editing. I mean, to just know, Absolutely. let's yeah. get rid of all this dialogue. We can do it with just her face and her hands and yeah. the two rings. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ron is a phenomenal editor. He really uh, has a, that's his forte. And he takes every, he doesn't give a ton of notes on the scripts. He really trusts his writers and lets us do um, our rewrites. And he, he sometimes will take a little mm -hmm. polish on it. Uh, but he, he's not heavy-handed. He loves all of us and trusts us. But in the editing room, when he gets in there, and that's where you have what you have. It's, you can't say, I mean, the first show I, I worked on, I remember sitting in the editing room and watching it with horror and going, oh, it's not supposed to be like that. That's not what I wrote. That's not it. That's not it. And the editor kept going, that is it. That's what it is. That's all we have. That's in the can. We can't reshoot it. This is, this is the footage. So sometimes the footage that you get isn't always going to match what you wrote. And so somebody, it takes someone like Ron, who's a genius with that, to see all the thousands of takes. And then sometimes he will, you know, they say that you can rewrite a script in the editing room, and you really can. And he does that and sometimes switches things around. Um, in fact, he switched the order of the witnesses around in this episode um, because once he saw it, he realized, like, the guy that said, 
about the great winged bird needed to come. He was first originally to get the crowd going, but Ron was like, he needs to come right before they go back to the hole so that we end not on a positive note, so that there's more fear when they go back into the hole that night. And there's some other things that he switched around. So we're, I'm lucky to have that because, uh, you know, every writer, it's, it's a team effort. You know, I, I, I love sitting up here and, you know, uh, take, you know, it seems like taking all the credit for it, but if we didn't have the team we had down to uh, Gary Steele, our production designer who, who built that hole, and, and it looks like a real hole in the ground and who, you know, uh, every, everyone from, from just our dialect coach that tells us little Scottish words to use, or we have a Gaelic advisor, we, we have so many people that, that contribute and all those little details are what come together and makes us, makes us look good. You know, we're just lucky to have them. Uh, let's get the microphones uh, ready uh, and let's take some questions here. I don't want to hog all the questions. <laughs> um, I wanted to f ask you about uh, a little bit more about the writing process. You had said that um, throughout your Q&A and also when you were showing the pictures. Um, you, ha you said you start off with a storyboard and I think you have mentioned about um, rewriting. Um, I think that uh, you also mentioned that you have four writers and it, I think that the show does have a a coherency and a, a mm -hmm. sense that everyone is working together. But could you tell us a little bit about the process? Um, what do you work together? When do, when do you as a writer, because you, you, know, you have certain credits that are mm -hmm. is under your name, what part do you play and what part does um, the, sort of the team work in terms of what they do with the rewrite? Um, yeah, we have, we have our four writers plus Ron, the showrunner, and at the beginning of the season what we do is get together and we, we um, divide the book in all the chapters. We make a, um, our assistants make a, a, a chart of everything that happens in the book, and we have to decide how many episodes do you think it will fit in. Um, and also Stars has a you know, say of like, you know, this is how many episodes they might want to make, but they, they ask us, how, well, you think it will fit in this many? Do you need one or two less or one or two more? And so the first, <laughs> no, more, more. Um, but actually, if you stretched it out too much, the episodes wouldn't be jam-packed like this one. They'd mm -hmm. be like, there might be some boring ones. We don't want any filler episodes. We want everyone to be, you know, its own thing. So we get together in the first, I don't know, three or four weeks that we get together, we, we go through it and decide, okay, this is going to be, you know, in this, in this season, 16 episodes. And here's how it's going to be broken down. You know, the first episode will be this, and then I mean, and it do, it's not set in concrete. It can move a little bit, but basically, we stick to what the what we've arced out in the beginning. And we'll say the witch trial is going to be one whole episode. Lolly Brock, we're going to divide into two. You know, the chapters on Lolly Brock, and and the first one will just be them there, and then the second one, you know, will be this, or and then by the end. So we see so we kind of know which chapters, and some. Sometimes maybe there's five to eight chapters in one episode, and sometimes there'll be one chapter that's an episode, or sometimes, like in the case of Garrison Commander, it's maybe it's, pa it's a paragraph in a chapter that becomes a whole episode. And then there's episodes like The Watch, which I wrote last year, too, that isn't even in the book, but they mention The Watch, who are like the mob, the Scottish mob who comes to stay at Lollybrook, and we made a whole episode out of something that's really only mentioned briefly in the book. Um, and Horrocks, who we never meet, and we get to meet him in that episode. So, so once we have, and then we have one board that'll have all the episodes, one through sixteen. This year, one through thirteen, um, and then Ron will usually write the first one, which is traditional usually for the showrunner to write the first one. And then some some mm -hmm. staffs go in order, hierarchical order. Although we're pretty much all equal rank on our staff, so everyone will gravitate to a different one and say, "I want to write this one. I want to write that one." And we, they start assigning episodes. But unlike uh, network television, in network television, the whole staff um, works on an episode in the room on the story. And once the story is up on the board and, and broken down into scenes, one writer goes off and writes it, and the staff moves to the next one. And then they break off a person, and that person goes off. So you always have the whole staff, except for the writer who's off writing. Whereas in cable, if we have uh, five, since we have five writers total, we would do the first five or six. We break all of those a, and, and have the stories broken out. And then all of us go away and write. 
And then we come back, and when we come back, we have five or six scripts all done. And it's kind of harder to write because you don't know what comes before and afterwards. I mean, you know from the, what's on the board, but you haven't seen the voices maybe of the characters or, or whatever. So it's kind of tricky. You have to, you know, when we, get, we come back together, it's like, oh, wait, I put that in mine, but you put it in yours. Who's going to get it? Or, oh, you took that part in the book. You stole something from my chapter. <laughs> you know, like sometimes it's like, I know that's in another chapter, but it works better with my story. And so, sometimes we trade and we have to barter, like, well, I'll give you the, you know, this for that. If you take donuts in your episode, well, I'll give you the whatever. But, you know, there's things, there's moments we love, like the first kiss or Jamie telling Claire he loves her for the first time or whatever, and sometimes it doesn't fall exactly where the chapters are in the books. But, but um, we, we do go off and write them, and then we do a second round. So that's, that's kind of how it works. And when you finish your episode, you bring it back. Ron reads it and gives you notes. Um, you go back and do those notes. Then, then it goes to the studio and network. They give back notes. And sometimes they're like, oh, we love this in the book, and you guys skipped it. We, can we put that back in? Or sometimes they're like, um, ah, this part we didn't think you needed, you know. And, and usually it's pretty light. They're, they're, they trust us. They've been very supportive of us. Our network's amazing. Sony's amazing. They, they love the books. They love what we're doing, luckily. And, you know, that's not always the case. I've worked for networks where they don't like the show or where they don't, they just have a negative attitude and they can, they can note you to death. I mean, they can make you throw out a whole, I've worked on shows where they're just like, nope, don't like that episode, start over. And it's like shooting in three days, you have to write a new episode. Um, so we, we've been lucky and um, we get notes from them and then it goes to production and there's a production draft that gets put out and the, then the production team David Brown and his team on the ground in Scotland, they, that's when they start saying, oh, there's too many scenes. It's, you know, it's hard. To, you know, we got to fit them all or this one's expensive. Can we do it? Uh, you know, can we shoot this during the day because it's really expensive shooting at night or it's harder on the crew at night or, or we, we can't find a good this. Could we, could we move the church scene to somewhere else or, you know, whatever the production concerns are, we have to be aware of that. Sometimes it's the weather. Sometimes it's a schedule. But uh, they tell us what they can and can make happen. And we have to be very flexible. And that's hard to do because when you write it, you fall in love with it. And you're like, what do you mean I have to, ah, oh, you know, I can't, I can't change that. I can't, you know, I love that part. But you got it. You, it's not yours. You know, it's not your baby. It's everybody's baby. So you have to change things. Um, I just told this story about how I wanted to put a vase. You know the vase from the pilot when we shot Rent? My big idea was that when Claire's in the village to have a vase in the window that she sees. And I got a call from production. They're like, uh, we have a note for you. And I'm like, not the vase, anything with the vase. And they were like, the huts here, the, the cabins don't have windows. And I'm like, what do you mean they don't have windows? <laughs> they're like, well, they're thatched huts. They're from the 1500s. Look. And I'm like, send me a picture. What do you mean? And, and I flipped out because I really wanted that call back to the pilot that to have Claire look at the vase, I go, just take a hammer and make a window, just b break through the wall, make a window. And I wanted a vase with flowers, and then they were like, oh, another problem, there's no flowers. I'm like, what do you mean there's no flowers? In all of Scotland and all of the Highlands, they're like, it's winter, there's no flowers, we don't have flowers, we don't have a window, you need to do something else. And so it was something I had to change, and it killed me, but we ended up with, the, you know, the uh, wool walking scene. Which, was, which everyone loved. So sometimes you, you, I mean, that's what TV writing is. It's, you have to be very flexible. It's a collaborative, collaborative medium. So mm -hmm. students of you out there, if you're precious about your writing, you better stick to maybe novel. And even then, the editor changes things. But, you know, you're, you're <laughs> writing it for TV. It's a business. You're writing for a studio and a network. And, and there's 200 people working on the show, and they all are there to help make it better. So you have to be in that frame of mind. Mm. I was wondering, cause being um, because of Outlander, I've become like a Twitter addict. I'd never been on Twitter <laughs> before, and um, so I like follow things. You know, the 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 cast that are on Twitter, I I sort of follow what they're doing and everything. And I'm just curious. I noticed the writers mainly seem to spend a lot of time writing in L.A., and mm -hmm. then they do. It's mainly. It seems like well, he, Matt is mainly the one with the largest presence in social media, so he seems to go back and forth a lot. So I'm wondering what the point is why they send them to write in L.A., and then if they keep sort of sending you all back and forth. Well, you too. I don't um, know about the other two. Yeah, we, um, we do. The writers are based in L.A., and we all live in L.A., and we write from there. We do, we do go to, to Scotland to supervise our episode. We do block shooting, which means we shoot two episodes at once, 
um, instead of one episode at a time. Like in LA, when they're on a network show, they shoot one at a time. We shoot two at a time. So we go, and it takes two to three months to shoot two episodes. So whenever you go, you have to go for three months at a time. It's a long, it's a long time and a lot, a lot of travel. Um, and so we all do one or two tours of duty, call it, where we go to Scotland, and we supervise one of our episodes and one of somebody else's. So um, I was lucky to get to go to the witch trial. I wasn't there for rent. Actually, Matt covered for me on rent, and, um, and then I got to go for this one. Um, and I went this season, and, then, and did, I did my first episode, episode four, for season two. Um, but I wrote number seven, which I didn't get to be there for, which killed me because I love that yeah. one. Um, I think I better not even stray into season two territory because I don't want to say anything. I'll get fired. <laughs> but just between us, if season two is awesome just to, to say, to watch it because it's, it, it, the brilliant thing Diana does is recreate, in every book is a totally different show because um, in, in the next, um, in season two is half of it takes place in France. They go to France, they're, yeah, they're in the French court with King Louis, and it's all about Versailles and uh, you know, trying to stop Culloden from happening. And you know, in later books, you know, later books go to um, Jamaica. Go, they, they're on a ship for part of it. They go to America. Every book is a new chapter in the lives of these characters, and it keeps it keeps reinventing themselves, which is great for us because you know, we, you know, when you work on a network show, you get really tired of it writing the same thing, you know, 22, 24 episodes per season, you just get burnt out. And this is, you know, season two was like writing, I, I felt like I was mm -hmm. on a totally different show and could just write different stuff. It was, a, it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I forgot what the question was now, but, <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so we do take turns going to Scotland and, and you know, some of us, um, some of us go more than others. Some of us, um, try to write summer episodes <laughs> so, so that, because, uh, I, I can't do the cold um, very well, so I'm I'm kind of dreading ever having to go, you know, in January or February. But I will if I have to. Um, but I'll just dress up like. The, I mean, I was freezing, you know, in July. I was freezing, and what they call warm is like 47 degrees. And and the the drivers are all out there in their t-shirts, and they're like, boy, it's a hot day. It's a warm day. And I'm I'm you can't even see me my face just my eyes are sticking out because I'm wearing so many layers and they all can tell the California people you know <laughs> because we're walking around and they're like why are you wearing all those coats I'm like this is freezing <laughs> so um so yeah I, I'll probably get to go hopefully next year if there's a and, if and there's you a said season that two. each writer uh, you go uh, out in the field and you supervise one of your own scripts. But then you supervise one other script. So which one? Yeah, did you because do? you would never write back-to-back -back scripts. So right. like on this one, I did eleven and twelve, and so twelve was the Lollybrock episode. That's why I have pictures of the mill and of Lollybrock because I and the dog because I was there for the Lollybrock, which Anne wrote. Mm -hmm. But um, but Matt was there for Rent because he had written three, I think. So three and four were together. So whatever you know mm -hmm. um, of, of the new season, uh, I wrote seven, and I think. Matt wrote six, so it's like mm -hmm. it, whoever's there. But you'd you would never write two back to back; it'd be too much work. So nobody does um, two really, except yeah. I think Ron, the finale, or Ira did the finale with yeah. Ron, I think. Yeah. So um, I would like to know um, what it was like with Diana Gabaldon, um, and because she wrote one of the scripts for season two, I can't she did? recall exactly which one she said she wrote, but. I, I was good, so <laughs> but it wasn't. Um, uh, I was just wondering um, what what the, the writing team um, thought of that um, experience. Did you have the same um, kind of input and arrangement that you all, the four of you, have now? How did that work? Um, yeah, she, she wrote an episode for the new season. Um, it hasn't shot yet. Um, and she I think she had a good experience. She loved it. It was a new thing for her. We were very happy and excited to have her, um, and um, I actually wasn't. I was in Scotland while she was in the room um, doing her story, so I wasn't there to see how it went. But I heard that she, had, yeah, she tweets and all that. I heard it that she had a good time. Um, I think you know she's always had an appreciation for what we do, but I think 
having done it, she'll probably see it from the other side too. Mm -hmm. uh, like I can't imagine writing a book. I could never, I can't even write a feature. People say, don't you want to write a movie? And I'm like, that's long. It's like a hundred and something pages. <laughs> I, I think in little 50 page chunks. That's how I think. Um, I can't make a bigger story than that. I just, I don't even try to, to um, make it come out to a certain amount of pages. It just does. I don't know how, but I just write it, and it always is sort of in the ballpark of that. Um, and I also think in continuing stories. I couldn't do a movie. I have no interest in a movie because they're over. I mean, they're over. And, and I don't think <laughs> of characters like that. I think of that they're ongoing. I'm not interested in people that are over and I'm never going to think about again. I want... I want, I shouldn't say that in this theater because it's movie writing is part of it. And I, I just don't even go to that many movies. I like TV. I like to see them year after year to see what happens to them. And even when the show's over, to me, they're still alive. Those people are still out there somewhere and I wonder about them. I think of what they're doing because they've become a part of, part of my life kind of, you know, and, and they, so I, li I like that element of it. So I think to write in a different medium is probably interesting and challenging. And uh, I know she's real excited and we're excited to have her. So uh, it should be fun. It should be fun to see it. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, three quick questions. One, when will season two debut? Two, why weren't you guys nominated for Emmys yes. in any category <laughs> but music? I was very angry uh. because the production values, the acting, Everything is so fantastic. And then a harder question. The last episode of the season is quite um, an eye-opener and difficult to watch. And um, I'm wondering what the conversations were like about how far to go um, with something I've never seen on TV or the movies before. Right, Thank you. right. Thank you, because I just get so much pleasure out of this show. Thank I wish you. I could get a job helping make it. <laughs> Thank you. When, when, um, I, when I try to describe this to my friends, because they know how excited I am about uh, the show, and uh, I describe, yes, it's a, it's a time-traveling bodice ripper, where it's the men who get their bodices ripped. <laughs> That's a great, a great description. I love that description. It's true. Um, I don't know the the date that season two is going to start. Do you know? Do you guys know? <laughs> we know nothing because we're just. I'm hearing, you know, somewhere in the spring. Uh, um, it's a stars question. As soon as possible, stars, come on. Um, I know people are dying for it to come back, which I'm I'm so happy about. And uh, um, yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be great um, when it starts. It's gonna it's just gonna rock everybody um, uh, because it's so different. It's really different. It'll be a real treat. Um, and the Emmys, you know, you know, I, I got to be honest and say we were a little bummed. You know, mm -hmm. of course, it's always nice to win awards. I've never gotten one. I'd love one, but <laughs> but you know, um, you know. Well, Game of Thrones swept the Emmys, and they, I hear that they didn't get anything at all their first season. Um, I think a lot of people still don't know about the show. Um, and, you know, really, I mean, awards are nice, but that's really not why we do it. Uh, after being in this business for, gosh, so many years now, I don't know, 25 years, some, two, I'm old. That's a long time. Um, I got to say, you know, to, to, to what's important to me now is working with a good group of people, a great group of people, on material that I really love. And, and I've had opportunities to go on, on shows. I've been offered ungodly amounts of money and, and all, and, and, and prestige and things that you think are important. But I've been doing it long enough to know that there is no amount of money that is worth hating your job every day or going to work with people that are jerks um, or, or shows that you don't care about where you're phoning it in. I really don't care. I would work on this show for free. Don't tell stars that. But um, <laughs> that's what's important to me now. And I've taken pay cuts. I've done shows, other shows where I've taken pay cuts just because I wanted to be part of it. And I remember when Carnival first came mm -hmm. along, they, they offered me a, a fraction of my salary of what I had made before. But I wanted to work with Ron Moore. I wanted to work for HBO because I hadn't been on cable. 
And, and my agent said, well, you know, we're taking a big pay cut and working on cable. We'll get you other jobs because of the, you know, you'll be in a different world, the cable world. And that's where I wanted to be because there was more freedom than some of the network cookie cutter mm -hmm. shows. Although there's still some good network shows, but today's, you know, field is wide open and there's so many shows that are just out of the box that, that I would just, you know, I want to do something I love and, and the money and the awards and all that, if it comes later, that'd be great. But I couldn't be happier. I'm so thrilled to go to work every day uh, with the people that I do and to have these actors and to have this, these books and this story. I'm never bored. It's, it's an mm. honor and a pleasure to, to write this. I'm excited about it. Uh, and I don't think I will get bored because every book mm. is different. And so, you know, fingers crossed for eight seasons, nine seasons. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, to have you guys, I mean, to have people that love it, you know, to, ha to have people that love it, uh, means so much more to know that it's and that's why an event like this is so important because we don't get to you know we don't get to mm. see, see things like that and so to, to have just get to watch it with you guys tonight uh was thrilling and that's that's really why we're doing it so you know maybe next year but if not that's okay with us i just had a light bulb moment you said you wrote the watch right yes. the yes. episode of the watch you're the uh Mary Queen of Scots watch lady, would you please tell us the story <laughs> about that? Um, yes, yes. The, wa um, the, the last episode I wrote last season was called The Watch, where this, the this equivalent of the Scottish mob goes and ensconces themselves at Claire and Jamie's house, and they have to navigate through that. But uh, it was, The Watch was the real name in the book and in real, in, uh, of, of the Scottish mob. And I just, I like metaphors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> English major. But, um, and... And uh, so I wanted, you know, the title cards that, you know, can always be some little thing from the show. And I had the clever idea, I thought. It's actually kind of corny, but it was like, the watch. Oh, let's get a real watch. I wanted the guy to have a watch and um, so that we could do a title card that was a watch. And I, mm -hmm. want, I knew that he was going to, um, did he get killed? No, I don't even remember. Anyway, he gets in some kind of trouble. And he, I wanted him to drop the watch, and I wanted the title card to be a watch on the ground. I like a pocket watch, but I just thought fancy pocket watch. But again, Google, thank God for Google. Um, I was, when I was Googling around about 17th century or 18th century pocket watches, this thing came up about Mary, Queen of Scots, that she had um, designed a watch. A it was called a mm -hmm. Memento Mori watch, which is, means like, you know, always remember death can be mm -hmm. near or whatever. And it had a saying on it that was something like, death visits with uh, impartiality, the the castles of the rich and the houses of the poor, or something like that in Latin. And I was like, oh my God, it's perfect. It was a light bulb moment of, this is perfect for the episode. Um, and uh, so I said, well, this character, who's a criminal, mm -hmm. could have this watch that he stole, and he could say it's from Mary, Queen of Scots. Um, and uh, the, the interesting thing is, that, you know, when, again, this is one of those collaborative things. When it came up in the production meeting, and and I said, I want this watch, and it's got to be modeled on the, and it's got to, they're like, well, we can't, you know, go buy a watch because those things are, and I said, why not? And they're like, well, it's copyrighted, and we can't just buy, jewelry designs are copyrighted, so you can't just go buy a piece of jewelry and use it in the show. Um, and they're, I'm like, you can go down to any Harley Davidson shop and just buy a watch <laughs> on a chain, I don't care. You're not going to see it that close up. I'm not taking the watch out of the show. Every show that I write has a thing. And the watch was the thing in that show, and this show is the birds. And it was the other or one the that base. was, you know, yes, I was like, ah. And they always target that to take out, whatever my thing is. Even in season two, I had a couple of things. I can't tell you yet, but after season two, I'll tell you what the thing was, and I had to fight to keep them in the show because they don't understand that that's what made me, what the inspiration from that made me just, you know, write that, have the juice to write the whole episode. So they said, well, we're going to have to make it, and it's going to cost like this ungodly amount. I was like, $2,000 or something, it's going to cost to make, if you're going to have to make this. And I stood up in the meeting and said, I will pay for it myself. I will pay for it out of my salary. I have to have the watch in the show. And then, then they started laughing, and I think it shamed them into kind of like, okay, we, I think we're going to have to have a watch in the show. But they're very, they're wonderful people, the production guys, and they try to make happen whatever we dream up. They will go to the ends of the earth to get it for us. So they're like, all right, all right, we're going to get your watch. And I said, no, seriously, I real buy it, and I want it at the end. I want to keep it. 
and they're like, you can't have it because it belongs to Sony. And it's got to go in a storeroom because if they ever need it in another episode or something, um, there's rules about that. But I'm probably going to try to bribe someone to get that watch. But, but that will be the thing that, you know, I know, like, I don't know, when Mary Tyler Moore or some of those old <laughs> shows go down, they always ask, what would you take from the production? What would you uh. keep? And if this, after eight seasons, knock on wood, I'm going to find, or nine, I'm going to have that watch. It's going to be on my desk next to my Glasgow coffee cup um, because I was very inspired by and that. And your of <laughs> From your to God's ears. And before we thank Tony for coming here, just want to thank all of you all for coming from Los Angeles and I know, Seattle. you guys are awesome. And yes, thank you so much. And everyone that came. People, everyone that came. People from the community and our classes who are here, thank you very much. And thank you, Tony. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. <laughs>